The views and opinions in the following program remain those of the producer or sponsor, and not those of Medford Community Cablevision, its staff, management, board of directors, or other affiliates. Hello sports fans and welcome to another edition of Real Grass, Real Heroes. A look at the golden age of sports in Boston when the heroes were real heroes and the game was played on real grass. Tonight is a very, very, very special show. Uh, right now we're broadcasting on the 100th anniversary of Fenway Park and they, they tell me there are over 300 former Red Sox players were at Fenway Park and there was one gentleman one of the most accomplished of them all, one of the most accomplished athletes in the history of professional sports. He was not able to make it, but I do have him on the line right now. His name is Gene Conley, and Gene is the only man in sports history to hold world championships in two major sports. He was on the 1957 Braves, I almost said Boston Braves, 1957 Braves, World Championship team when they beat the Yankees in the World Series, and with three World Champion Celtic teams in 1959, 60, and 61, he's even more accomplished than that. My God, there's so many things I can say about him, but uh, his wife said some wonderful things about him in a book about him called One of a Kind, and, uh, but Gene Conley is, oh God, he's played with the best of the best, and also... Uh, one of the records, one of the numerous records that I remember is uh, Gene is the only man in baseball history to be named MVP in two different seasons of the minor leagues. Gene, I can go on and on, but <laughs> let's start and let's say hello to Gene Conley. Gene, well, how are you, pal? I'm fine, Jim. Good talking to you. Good, good God. Uh, I love hearing your stories and everything, <laughs> and uh, it, it, th that laugh is so infectious. It, it's great. Uh, right now, you can't see it, Gene, but uh, the show is being taped, by the way. But uh, right now, on the screen, and all the while that you and I are talking, is the picture of the cover of that book that your wife, Kathy, wrote. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. She worked on that for two or three years, and, uh, and uh, I didn't even know she was writing it half the time. <laughs> well, remember, now, you and I have been friends for about almost 30 years now from the old Boston Braves annual reunions. And I've been telling you forever you should write a book. I, I know that you're a very modest guy and you didn't think there was any great accomplishment there, but of course uh, everybody else knows. Uh, some of the guys that I'd love to hear you talk about, and naturally Ted Williams, even though you never played with him, you did play against him, and uh, uh, you can tell us some stories about him. Warren Spawn, absolutely positively. Hank Aaron, Willie Mays, your room with Robin Roberts, you know, one of the greatest pitchers of all time. But uh, start me off with any of your memories about Teddy. And you, you could, if you want, you can start off with that game in the All-Star game when you struck him out. Well, <laughs> I could tell a couple of stories, I guess. I never, I never did have the uh, honor of playing with him. I, you know, I know, always knew about him. I was out of the National League. But uh, I always knew uh, who he was and followed him even then. But uh, when I came over here in uh, 19... 61 uh, from Philadelphia. Uh, he had just he had just finished in 1960, I guess. He hit hit that big home run, you know, the last yep, time at bat. Last home run. He hit that one, and uh, I was with the Celtics at the time, and I'd left Philadelphia, and I came over to Boston to to uh, get ready for basketball with the Celtics, and uh, I went in the locker room. First time I was in the locker room with the uh, with the uh, Red Sox locker room, and uh, there was, uh, the guy, Vince Orlando, was the clubhouse guy. And uh, he says, you know, you're, you're coming over here now. And I said, well, where, where are you going to locker me? And he says, you're going to get Ted Williams' locker. How's that? 
Wow. I said, oh, that sounds pretty good. It's right next to my zone, I remember. And uh, he says, actually, you, you're going to get two lockers. You're going to get two places. He says, uh, when Ted was here, he had to have an extra locker for all the sport, sports sports people that come in and interview him yep. and, and yep. all the stuff he always carried with him. And uh, I said, well, that's fine. I'll only need one locker, but <laughs> oh, that that'll be great. So uh, I looked in the locker, and, and doggone if I didn't see a bat there and a couple of sweatshirts and a few things there. And I said, uh, well, uh is Ted is Ted coming back or anything here? And he says no. He says as soon as he, as soon as the, the game was over, he took off for Florida, I think, or someplace going fishing. Wow, what a find! He just left fight. everything here. And I said, well, can I have that bat and some of those <laughs> things he had, you know? And I didn't even think of memorabilia or anything. I just thought it would be nice to have. And so I took the bat that he hit the that ball that uh, last home run with. Yeah. And. Uh, Took it home. I lived in Foxboro then, and I gave, I gave the kids. They were, they were always playing around the streets and stuff, you know, with baseball and going down to the high school field. So they took that bat, and they, that thing was bounced around for, oh, a number of years. Then I went in when I was in business. I called on a guy, and uh, he said his kid was in little league, and he wanted something from Ted Williams. And I said, Well, I wish I had something, but I just don't. I said, the only thing I got is an old bat. It's all scratched up, and beat up, and everything else. He says, well, I'd take it. So I, well, gave, away, <laughs> I gave away that bat. I, I, guess, I guess you <laughs> would take it. Wow, holy mackerel. Uh, an old bat is like saying the Mona Lisa is just an old pitcher. <laughs> holy mackerel. Did Teddy <laughs> ever hear that story? No, I didn't. <laughs> My God. But, um, so anyway, I found out years later that bat was pretty. Everybody, everybody had Ted Williams' last home run bat, but they don't know I'm the really I'm the one that really had it and gave it away. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm surprised the media doesn't know that. Now I remember you telling me that story a few years ago, and uh, I mentioned it. I think I mentioned it to uh, uh, Bob Ryan, uh -huh. and uh, he said, "Nice." I never heard anything. If Bob had heard it, I'm sure he would have written a story about it. <laughs> But well, I, I got a couple of sweatshirts that I used to go around uh, for years mowing the yard and carry, and just wearing it, you know, just outside outside the house all the time. And I got a call from uh, some doctor down in Atlanta or something wanted to know if I had anything that Ted Williams. And then I started thinking, no, I don't. I don't have a thing. Then I thought, well, I got the, one of those old sweatshirts. It was kind of torn and, and had holes in it and everything. I said, I explained to him it was all shot, and I've had it around for about 10 years. He said, that sounds all right to me, you know. So my wife, my wife sewed up a couple of places, ironed it all up and everything, and he gave me $1,000 for it. Wow. <laughs> Terrific. You know what? I, uh, felt, I, like, I felt like I said, I got, I got an old jock strap here that said <laughs> Ted Williams' name. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can get $300 anyway. <laughs> my God. You know, uh, War I remember talking to Warren Spawn, and he told the story, uh, and I, I don't remember if he told it to me or if he told it to the whole audience, but uh, remember the City Series, the Braves and the Red Sox oh, yeah. would yeah. always end up, you know, with the two games of the City Series, one at Fenway and one at Braves Field. Uh -huh. And he said one particular game in the first inning uh, on, on a 3-2 uh, a pitcher, Ted had two strikes on him anyway, and he threw him that screwball changeup and uh -huh. Ted missed it by a mile, <laughs> and uh, so that so now in the eighth inning, ninth inning with the game on the line, uh -huh. he threw it to Ted again, and uh -oh. Ted hit it a mile. Uh -oh. <laughs> and as he was, you know, rounding first, you know, headed to second, Spawn looked at him. He says, "You're sucking me, didn't you?" And he <laughs> says, "Ted, he just shook his head and he says, what do you think?' You know. Now I mentioned that years later. I mentioned that to Ted." And Ted said, yeah, he says, just proves my point. Pitches are the stupidest people in the world. <laughs> yeah, he always said that. Well, you know, I did have, I, a lot of people uh, asked me if I ever pitched against him. And you know, Jim, I did one time in, uh, uh, I pitched in three All-Star games. I yep. got in, and I was, the one in 1959 was in Los Angeles. 
And Ted was just at, uh, right at the end of his career, I guess, the year before he quit. And he was at the, he was in the, he didn't start or anything, but he was out there in L.A. And uh, Drysdale started the game, and I came in after Drysdale. And all of a sudden, I'm out on the mound. It's about the fifth or sixth inning. And I'm standing there, and everything's quiet. And nobody's at, nobody's coming up to bat or anything. And all of a sudden, Williams come out of the dugout, and the crowd went crazy, you know. And he come he came up to the plate, and he was twisting his bat and carrying on and everything. I'd never pitched to him, so like <laughs> Del Crandall was catching, and he fouled off a couple of pitches, and then I threw him an overhand curve, a drop, I called it in those yep, days. the 12 to 6. And he he, met, he missed it by a foot, I think, in, in uh, strike three, and, and uh, so I didn't pay any attention to it. I thought, well, that's good. He's got another guy out here, you know. Yeah. And uh, so I, I didn't see him until I was up in uh, – uh, I think it was Marion, where Dominic DiMaggio had a Jimmy Fun uh, golf tournament about 20 years after that, a mm-hmm. year later. And I went up there, and I was he was given a speech. He played golf that day, but he was given a talk. And I know his son, uh, John, was sitting there. I sat at the table with him. And, uh, he st- and I went over to him. I hadn't seen him, and I said, Hello, Ted. I said, uh, I'm Gene Conley. And he says, I don't know who in the hell you are. And I said, well, I just wanted to say hello. He says, yeah, and I remember that dinky curveball you got me on, too. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, you did miss it, didn't you? Was it that, was, that was about the end of the conversation, but he laughed about it. He was, he was good humored, but I, I always said, when people ask me, I tell them I struck him out, and they, they always poke each other and say, well, come on, Homer, we got, we got to leave now. He's He's hallucinating a little bit. <laughs> yeah. He was probably mad that he never got a chance to get at I, you again. That's what, that's what reminded me of that you know? song story. I'm glad I didn't place him again. <laughs> he, he was something else. But, the, you know, uh, Gene, you played with some of the greatest ball players. By the way, our studios were in Medford, so it would be very remiss if I didn't go immediately to Bill Mumbocat. You Bill did Mumbo play with Kett. Bill Mumbocat. I sure did. He, we were roommates, matter of fact, one year. You got some recollections of him, I'm sure. Oh, what a nice man he was! I was, he, he was put in the, uh, I think he was put in the Red Sox uh, Hall of Famer. Yes, he and, was. Uh, and uh, he invited me to the table, and it was nice. He, we were always good friends, and they they had a ballpark there, and I believe it was Med, is it Medfield where he lived, Medford? Or no, in Medford. Medford. Huh? Medford, right next to Somerville. Right, and uh, they they. Uh, they, uh, I had a ball field they named after him, so I went over there yep. and we, we tossed the ball around a little bit, and it was really fun. I, I've always enjoyed uh, Bill Mumblecat. It, it, what an amazing thing that, that you had. Well, I mean, the Red Sox had two local players that really had uh, great accomplishments, Tony Canigliaro and, of course, Bill Mumblecat pitching that no-hitter, you know. And, uh, oh, yeah. I, oh, he, he, had, he had some stuff. He he brought it home, and, and you know he had great control. That was one of his one of his main assets. He had stuff with control, so he was a good good pitcher. But the, you know his arm just didn't. You know he only got so many pitches in there sometime, and, that, and he didn't have a real long career. But he was sure good while he pitched. You know, there's another player that I consider a very underrated Red Sox player. It's Frank Malzone. You did play with Frank Malzone. Oh, I guess, yeah. I, I played against Malzone in the minor leagues. And you, but you played with him as a teammate on the Red Sox. Yeah, he was in the minors in the farm system with, uh, uh, let's see, who was their, their A-League in, the, in uh, Scranton, I believe it was. Yep, in Pennsylvania, sure. Yeah, and uh, I always thought he was a pretty good hitter then. Uh, he, he, he went the opposite field on me a couple of times, and uh, I remember Frank Malzone and uh, – and, uh, when I got over here, you know, I guess he had played in a few All-Star games and stuff, and uh, and uh, I always, I always, uh, he says if Gene, he says if there's a swing and bunt coming my way or somebody drops one, drags one down over over this direction, he says, do one thing for me, and I said, what's that? He says, either lay down on the mound so I can go to first base. <laughs> yeah. And I said, how about I just spread my legs and you, <laughs> you throw it over? <laughs> he said, either one. 
So I never worried about a ball going over that way with my elbow. It, you know, it, well, I'm sorry, go ahead, finish. I was just going to say, you take care of it for me. Yeah, it, you know, people uh, don't stop to think about what a great fielder he was. Oh. But when he was uh, playing third base, Brooks Robinson was with the Orioles. Yeah. And that's when they started giving out gold gloves. And Frank Malzone got the first gold glove at third base, not Brooks Robinson. Oh, and I that says know. a lot about him. Well, I knew he could feel. I knew he could feel. I didn't know he got, I got the gold glove. But that, that, that doesn't surprise me at all. Doesn't surprise me. And, and, and he could hit. He he yeah. put a few dents in that fence out there too. You know. Yes, he did. Uh, he was a uh, he was the number five hitter. Uh, one of the number five hitters uh, to follow Bobby Doerr. Bobby Doerr, it, to me, he was one of the greatest number five hitters in the history of baseball. And uh, I, I was so. By the way, if you didn't hear it, he did make it to Fenway Park. They brought him in uh, from California. I did hear about it already. He did, he, but him and Johnny Pesky, it was, you know, a, about two years before Ted died, I had tried to work out a thing to be able to go down to bring in Bobby Doerr, okay. Dom DiMaggio. I talked to Dom DiMaggio about it. He was all for it, and Johnny Pesky and Ted Williams. I wanted to do an interview with the four of them. Oh, my goodness. Uh, that would have been great, huh? But, of course, I grew up in the era when these guys – were great. They were uh, first, second, third, and then fifth in the order. And fourth at that time was Gene Stevens. Vern, uh, Gene Stevens. Vern Stevens. G oh, Junior. Vern Stevens, yeah. Vern yeah, Stevens. Junior Stevens. Well, you had you had to be a kid, though. Oh, know? I was. I, I was a little kid. Really enjoyed it, huh? But, but I, I was I was into baseball. You know, uh, the very first uh, game I went to was in 1946. Uh -huh. And I remember, my, you know, I, I just couldn't believe that I was going to see Ted Williams live. And uh, I'd read so much about him. And, uh, and my father said, if you're really a good guy, maybe he'll hit a home run for you. And sure enough, he hit a home run. Uh -huh. You know, and so uh, well, about three weeks later, went to another game, and Ted hit a home run. The first three games that I ever saw of the Red Sox, Ted hit a home run in each one. Oh, wow. And for about the first 20 games that I went to, the Red Sox won them all. And in uh, 19, 1948, the playoff game against Cleveland, I didn't go to the game. It was on a Monday. We had school. I didn't go to the game. They lost. And I blamed myself for a couple of years. <laughs> for not going. Huh? I, yeah, I, I should have hooked school and gone to the game. And you know, But anyhow, the, the great memories uh, there. Uh, tell, you got some stories about Warren Spawn. I, I never realized as a kid, you know, what a cutoff Warren Spawn was. Funniest guy in the world. Well, you know, I got a, a letter the other day. Somebody was writing some stories, you know, about old Braves, and they asked me who the funniest guy I, I were in, in uh, while I was playing uh, up there in the big leagues. Who was the, who was the funniest guy? And I didn't like that remark, funniest. There, there's nobody was funny. But there's I got a lot you. of guys that were were clever and yep. and uh, and uh, pulled the, uh, you know, a little little incidents, but having fun at it, you know, never to hurt anybody. Sure. And I I said Lou Burdett was the cleverest cleverest guy yep. ever. Oh, Lou was Lou was really something special, and I you know what a great pitcher he was. But, oh boy, but, yeah. But he was uh, he he was he was a real funny guy. Lou was he's he's uh, I I could tell you a couple stories that that. Uh, should just, tell, just, tell me just, one of them anyway. Well, oh, well, he was down in Florida I, I, playing ball. I, I he was. Uh, I remember one time he West Covington was on the team and uh, and they were always making fun of West Covington's hat. You know, he, in those days the ball players wore a hat once in a while. And West Covington had joined the team, and, and uh, I don't know whether it was '57. It might have been the year we won. He came up and uh, he had this hat on, and we were on the bus. The next thing you know, it looked like a fire was started back there. <laughs> him, him and Spawn <laughs> burned his hat <laughs> on the bus. <laughs> what, a, what a way to break in. <laughs> well, and Tommy Holmes was manager at that time, wasn't he? No, that was Fred Haney was the manager. That was it, around 57. They brought oh, okay, to the 57. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking, I, I know your rookie year, Tommy Holmes was manager. Yeah, that was in Hartford. Hartford, in uh, he was my manager in 1951, my first year in uh, 
uh, organized baseball. And, and I was about 20 years old, and he played right field. <laughs> yep. Oh, I remember him well. He won number one. Yep. And he, he was right field for us at Hartford. And, uh, and uh, Tommy Holmes loaned me. I was getting married. That was the year I, I'd just been married. Yep. Uh, uh, down in um, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. I, I, and I was just a kid, and my, my wife and I, I was 20, and she was, I think, 19. And <clears throat> I went over to him, and, and I said, Tommy, I said, uh, I want to marry this girl back back, uh, back, east, back west. And I said, but I haven't got any money. <laughs> she looked at me, and I was only making about, well, I was making about 350 a month then at yeah. Hartford. And he, I said, he says, how much do you need? And I said, well, if you can give me $300 loan, I'll pay it back. Might take a few, a few checks, but I'll pay you back. Yeah. He says, all right. He says, I'll do it. And uh, sure enough, uh, she flew down. Took about two days to fly in those days, 51. And we got married. And uh, so, so I saw Tommy. Oh, many years later. I'd seen him a couple of times, but I, but uh, this one time he was giving a talk down in Boston, and he saw me out in the crowd, and he says he told everybody, he says, there's a ball player out there in the crowd that uh, played for me at Hartford, Connecticut years ago, he said. And he says, I loaned him some money to get married. And he really, and he says, he never did pay me back, and he says, I, and I, I'm looking to hear, he says, he owes me over $11,000 in interest. <laughs> <laughs> I hollered out, and I said, Tommy Holmes, I paid you back. It took me a few checks, but I made it, he started laughing. <laughs> but actually, you, you had paid him back, hadn't you? Oh, yeah, I paid yeah. him back, we just took a few checks. A few, you know, every two weeks we got paid, so I gave him 50 bucks every so often. <laughs> But he was just like, he, was, he said it as a joke, you know, and he says, he owes me 11000 some odd dollars. He never did pay me back. <laughs> you know, uh, Tommy Holmes was always a hero uh, to us guys, and he was the very first celebrity that I ever met in, uh, when I was at the ballpark. And um, the, uh, one of the carpenters, or the head maintenance man, was a fellow named, uh, oh, God, I forgot his name, an Italian fellow lived next door to me. And so he introduced me to Tommy Holmes, and I remember looking up to Tommy Holmes, you know, this tall guy. Look it up, huh? I, I, know, I know, back then, that's how small I was. Yeah, I was going to say. You know, I, I, was, I think I was eight years old. Uh -huh. and, uh, and I remember he's, he looked down, and he says, well, what a big fella. He says, you're going to make a heck of a ball player someday, you know. And uh, so now when I finally get to meet him as a grown-up, and, of course, he's only like 5'6", five, 5'7". Five, yeah. But uh, at any rate, uh, he was leaving. I, I think you were there, I'm not certain, in, in the hallway as we were leaving, uh, you know, the, uh, the Braves reunion. Uh -huh. And there's his wife trying to drag him out. And so I, re I reminded him about the, the story about him lending you the money. Uh -huh. He stopped to talk, and of course, he talked a mile a minute. He talked forever. And his wife said to him, come on, we got to go. And, she, and he said, just one second. She stood there, she took off her coat, and she looked at me and she says, you see what you started? We'll be here for another two hours he, now. He, he loved to tell stories, and, and he was, oh, what a nice guy. He'd talk, he'd talk to a post. <laughs> uh, what, what a great guy he was. You know, another one of the, uh, uh, you were a rookie, uh, and you're a rookie of the following year, Hank Aaron uh, was a rookie. Yeah, well, that was in uh, in 1954. Yep. Uh, Aaron had played in Jacksonville, and then he went to spring training after he, he led everything in Jacksonville in uh, a ball down there, and we were all at spring training, and uh, I remembered him then. Uh, I I I'd, I'd been I was at Toledo while he was there. I I wasn't with the Braves then. I was with Toledo. I wasn't with Milwaukee until '54. So they took me up, they took me up in uh, 54 to, to Milwaukee because I'd, I'd won 23 games down in Toledo. So they took me up and, uh, and uh, I started off and, and uh, what's his name broke his ankle sliding in. Uh, Bobby Thompson broke his ankle. Yep. And uh, so the management and, and, uh, and uh, Charlie Graham and a bunch of them got together and tried to figure out 
who they were, who they could trade or whatever, and, and they decided, why don't we bring up this kid that did so well in Jacksonville, and, and they tore up, you know, in spring training did so well. So that was Hank Aaron. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they decided to take a chance on him in 54. Can you imagine and that? Right away, right away, he was just, he was line driving balls all over the place. He, mm -hmm. he was, after that, you could just see he just kept going. Great ball player and a great gentleman. I, I had an opportunity to view him a couple of times, you know, yeah. long after he retired. But a great, great guy. And, uh, you, you know, one of the, uh, the guys that I think is very underrated through history from the Braves was Eddie Matthews. Yes. Eddie, Eddie Matthews was, I don't need, is he in the Hall of Fame? I don't know Eddie, if he's not. Eddie's in the Hall of Fame, and Eddie had a good eye at the plate. He walked a lot. He, he didn't swing at bad pitches, and, uh, but he scored a lot of runs. He was on that base a lot. And he could, he could scat, too, for a big guy. He was, yep. he was 190, 200 pounds, and he, he could fly. And uh, I, I, I remember he was, he was kind of a, a funny guy at times, you know. He, I remember one time we were in Chicago playing the Cubs one afternoon, and and, uh, and I played day ball in those days, and, and it was a, a, a double header, and he started uh, went out the second second game, and he was up there on the bench, started doing push-ups, and he did about forty push-ups, you know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> he went out there and it hit a home run, <laughs> and I thought, well, that guy must be strong to do that. I, was, I think it tire him out, but. He was kind of, he was just kind of, had his, he was his own self, you know. Great, great ball player and a lot of fun. You know, the I, was, I was fortunate. I played with all the biggies. Uh, oh, Del Crandall was a great catcher. That's the I next enjoyed. name I wanted to bring up, Del Crandall. Yeah, I always, he was, he always pitched to Del Crandall. And, uh, and he was, uh, you know, it was, it's a funny thing. I, I didn't have to worry too much about uh, signals or anything because in those days I didn't pitch but uh, fastball on the curve, mm -hmm. fastball on the curve. Yep. And uh, if you got if you had the stuff, you could do it. You know. And so, but my curve was over the top. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that that's the one that kept me go kept me going because I threw hard enough that they had to look for it. And then I'd throw them a I called it an out drop, but it was. It wasn't a flat one. It was just a drop. Yeah. So uh, shoot, is, I see these guys nowadays. They're just. I think it's great that they mix them up. You know, they got three or four pitches, and they have pitches that go down. They have a split finger. They call it now splitter and. Yeah. And uh, all you know, sinker balls, and, and but uh, I had I had to try I had to do it just like the only thing I could do is a. I couldn't make a ball go down. It was a sinker, so uh, it kind of bothered me a little bit because I didn't get too many double plays. You know, if you don't have a have a, a, a sinker or something that goes down, you get a lot of double plays, and that helps you a little bit. But mm -hmm. hey, I, I I I took what I had, and as long as I could. <laughs> yeah. Was Johnny Sane with the club when you uh, first broke in? Uh, no, no. Sane was. Uh, I guess they traded him to the Yankees. Um, yeah, and, and he became a, a great, great pitching coach uh, with the Yankees. That's what, yeah, he, I know he, he wrote a book about pitching, how the, the spin of the ball does things and everything. And, uh, I think they called him the man of a thousand curves, didn't they? Yeah, that, well, that's what I hear. I, I, I didn't know much about Sane. I, I just met him my first year when I went to spring training when I signed the contract. My dad, uh, my dad uh, I was offered some pretty good money with Detroit. And uh, the Yankees and a couple other teams, but my dad said, said uh, he, he helped me out a little bit. He, was, he loved baseball, and he says, well, he says he talked to this scout, you know. I was only a kid. They were following me around. He says, if you come to the Braves, he says, well, my dad says, well, well if we ever get in the World Series, I want to make sure that my family all get to a, get a go to the World Series. We want all of ourselves paid. We want paid to... Uh, for transportation and this and that, and he thought that was a, a, a great like a bonus. <laughs> I thought years later, I thought, why, why did you get my, get me twenty or thirty thousand instead of going to a ball game? I, I, I know. <laughs> he liked baseball so much; he thought that was a good deal. <laughs> but you, anyway, it worked out fine. You know the uh, <laughs> the, 
thinking back, and this has come up many times, I think Joe DiMaggio even said that uh, to you one time, that uh, uh, you were underpaid and you had to play two sports uh, or something or other. Uh, uh, but uh, Kathy mentioned it in your book uh, when you met Joe DiMaggio. But it, if you, did you ever stop to, did, did that ever bother you or did you ever stop to think about it? I, I know Cozy uh, uh, says the same, he says, I, I never gave it a thought. But if you were playing even 10 years ago, you, you would have been bringing down five, 10 million a year in, in each sport. Well, I, you know, you, you really, in a way, I was, I was fortunate enough that in those days, uh, they, they overlap, but not too much. You know, like yep. uh, a lot of times I'd be pitching, uh, I'd be uh, playing basketball, you know, and the playoffs were over. And Red used to say, all right, now you go down, uh, go down to Florida and, and, and try to get out of shape so you can pitch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Red, you don't know how hard it is, really. It's a different, it's a different sport. But he always, he was such a basketball man. He didn't think baseball was guys were that good a shape, you know. But anyway, uh, uh, so I'd, I'd uh, sometimes I'd be playing in the playoff in the garden, and uh, the Red Sox players would be coming to the game to watch some of the playoff games. The guys that I was going to play yep. with, and I didn't even know who they were. And I'd be out there playing basketball, and then they'd, then uh, after we win, I, they'd still be playing baseball. And I'd run down there and and uh, get the guy named Paul Weiner, Big Poison. Oh yeah, Big Poison, yeah. Little Poison. I I met him and uh, and a couple of those old timers I'd work out with. You know, they'd hit me pepper and play catch and yeah, and uh, and I'd run a little bit, you know, and and I, I wasn't even throwing. I did that. Uh, oh, I think I missed about. Four or five spring trainings. I didn't. Even, I only took about a week or ten days for spring trainings. I didn't even. And, and they used to say, "Are you ready?" And I, and I said, "You're not ready." And I said, "Oh yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to go." I didn't even pitch to a batter. <laughs> Did you ever meet Dizzy Dean? Yeah, yeah. When he was he was announcing. Oh yeah, I know. He was an announcer one time, and I was pitching with with the Braves, and. Uh, I think we were pitching. The, I was pitching that day against the Giants in the Polo Grounds, mm -hmm. and I, I and I was at the Commodore Hotel, and he was next door to me, and we both came out of the hotel room at the same time. And he says, "Hey, big fella," he says, "You got the yellow apple today, don't you?" And I said, "Yeah, did he?" he, he <laughs> I didn't had, know him, but I, I said, "Yeah, he, go get him, baby, big boy." <laughs> yeah, he, was, he had that good old country uh, accent. Yeah he, yeah, he was real nice. You know, uh, of course, the reason I asked is because I, I know his career was ended when he got hit with a line drive in the big toe yeah. and broke the toe, and he altered his delivery so he yes. could pitch without pain, and that threw his arm off. And I think late in your career, did you have an ankle injury as well as a sore arm? And uh, uh, that's why I asked. Did he ever give you any advice about change or don't change your delivery? No. You know how I hurt my arm. I'll, I'll I'll tell you how I hurt my arm. I when I threw it, when I threw, my my mechanics weren't real good. I'm six foot eight, and I used to throw my leg up in the air, and it, my body didn't help me at all. But but I was a little deceptive to the hitter, and then I'd come down on top of a curveball. Mm -hmm. And I I my second year up, I was really rolling. Uh, I gotta tell you, I was eleven and three at the All Star break, and I got chosen for the all-star game mm -hmm. and uh and so what happened is i, I did pitch in the all-star game but i was i wasn't even throwing hard i was i was goosing it up there and i struck out three guys in a row and stan musual hits a home run and i, I get the win i'm the winning pitcher and I, I i had a sore arm and they let me pitch about three or four games after that and i lost I lost them all because i just couldn't couldn't throw hard. I'd torn something in my shoulder. Yeah. So I pitched uh, from 55 on, was taking a lot of cortisone shots and stuff. And uh, that's no excuse. No, no. I just, I, I, it was a paycheck. And I was, if I was getting them out, I was, if I was good enough to pitch. Well, I, that was my job. But uh, I, I was on a pretty good roll there until I. Well, you, uh, from what I remember, there were about three or four different times in your baseball career when you were on a good roll, and I think all three years with the Celtics, 
you were always on a roll. But, you know, you mentioned Red Auerbach and being a basketball guy, but I feel that Red Auerbach could have been a genius managing any sport there was. Now, I, I remember a story that you and he were driving someplace, New Hampshire, Maine or something, on a long drive, and listening to the first game of the 1959 World Series where Chicago scored nine runs in the, the uh, top half of the first. And uh, you know what it was? You know what it was, Jim? It was in, it was Cleveland and the Giants were pitching. That was in 54 because I didn't, I, 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 I started with the, with the Celtics in 54 in, in the fall. And then I, then I laid off and went and kept up with baseball because yep. I, I was doing pretty good with the with the uh, Braves, and I decided to uh, to uh, let it go in in uh, in basketball. And Red and I were riding in the same car. He, we, we, he used to smoke cigars, and I chewed tobacco while I was pitching. So I'd be spitting tobacco out one window, and he'd be blowing smoke <laughs> out the other way, talking, you know. And we were in we were watching Cleveland play. We were watching Cleveland play the Giants in his room one day. There's two or three guys over there was watching. He says, now look at this, look at this. He says, early wind. Early wind's out there pitching. He says, he's got a lead. He's got about a seven-point lead, seven-run seven, uh, lead against the Giants. He says, now, <laughs> now why, why, why don't they take him out? Why don't they take him out? It's, the, it's about the fourth inning. I said, Red? They don't take him out because he, he, he won't even get a record if, if they take him out because he, he wouldn't get the win. You got to pitch five. You got to pitch five innings, five full innings. He says, oh, then he started cussing. He said, what are you talking about? He says, save him. He could pitch the next day. He could pitch in two yep. days later. He says, they're stupid. They want to win the game. Don't say they want to act with records, the individual records. It's a team game, ain't it? <laughs> he was. He was really mad. Yeah, he but didn't understand. You know that. And, and Cleveland is all statistics almost. You sure. Know? And Cleveland lost that. I think Cleveland got swept in that series, they, didn't they? Yeah, they they did. They did. And that year, Cleveland had. Uh, I think they broke the record, or tied the record with 111 wins in '54, and yet they lost the World Series. He was. You know, this. That's a funny story too. I was one time. My wife and I were about in Oregon, and we had a little trailer, <coughs> and we decided to go down, take the little trailer, and go down to Disney, Disney you know, land, I guess it was. We pulled this trailer down there and, and uh, parked it, and we had the kids in the trailer and everything. In those days, you didn't worry about the kids, and, and I said, well, why don't we go down and, and see what it was like in uh, downtown and, and uh in uh, L.A., and she says, "Yeah, well, of course, my wife has never, never drank or anything, you know." And I said, "Well, uh, I tell you what," I said, "I want to see what it's like in this one club they call it the Brown Derby or something. It's very famous, you know." And I said, "I want to go in there for a second and see what's happening." So I went in there, and I, <laughs> I saw all of a sudden <laughs> I was standing there, and Leo DeRoche was standing there. <laughs> Standing there in the bathroom next to me. He says, oh, I thought of a gun coming. He was with Lorraine Day and all of them down there. Yeah. He says, hey, I want you to come up to the place up at our house, up in the hills, you know, and bring your wife along. I said, no, she don't drink, and I can't do that. And he said, well, where are you staying anyway? I said, Leo, I'm, we've got a little place outside of town, a little bit, <laughs> a little 14-foot trailer. I said, we got a place outside of town a little way. And, uh, he says, oh, well, he says, you know, he says, uh, you helped us win the pennant. And I said, how's that? He says, well, you beat Brooklyn five times. And he says, we beat you three times. <laughs> yeah, right. He says, you, you I said, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> the left-handed compliment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Leo the Lip Boy, did anybody ever deserve the nickname? Oh, man. But he, he was, was something else. Did you ever have any dealings with Casey Stengel? No, no, I was only I was only with the Red Sox, you know, briefly. Or actually, my third year, I was my arm was completely shot. When I first come over, come over from uh, Philadelphia, uh, I, 
I did, my arm did bother me in 61, and in 62 it felt pretty good, so I, I had, uh, I was getting shots down in uh, Providence, I didn't tell them I had a sore arm in 62, but, it, it, but they hit, they hit some spots in my shoulder that really helped me, so I went down there and got shots, oh, about every three weeks. <laughs> I was getting them from a, a, a bone doctor down there named A.A. A. Savastino. He was a Brown University uh, 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 doctor, yeah. And and he took he took care of me, and I, I was really firing away. I, and it was all shots. He says, "Gene, you're not going to be any good next year because these, this isn't going to hold." And I said, well, just get me through this year. And I, I had a good year, and the next year I couldn't throw the ball. Mm. <laughs> so they let me go. Well, well, you, you had a great career there anyway. By the way, y your first reaction when you first pitched in Fenway Park, y your first reaction to the Green Monster. Well, you know, I've heard this story from a lot of guys, and it's a true story. Because the first time I ever saw that place, I came up, you know, about the first the, – Going up the ramp from outside, yep. I, w I came up and I was. It was right about even with the dugout for the Brave, for the Red Sox dugout, and I looked out there and I saw that wall and I saw the field and everything, and it, it really was. It really was beautiful, but it was. I thought, boy, this thing is kind of short, and and. Uh, but then I, after I pitched there, I realized that there was there was room in right field and there was room in center, and uh, if you if you could. Pitch, pitch away from some, some of those guys, you know. You could hit them, make them hit the other direction and keep them off the wall. But uh, but uh, it was just, I was really impressed with the, the looks of the field and everything. It's kind of breathtaking, you know. Of course, the ballparks are back in the National League. You know, Ebbets Field, I pitched there a lot. And Polo Grounds is pretty close down the line. They're about 260, <laughs> 260 feet or something. I saw uh, Ebbets Field once, and I couldn't believe how small it was. It's a yeah. cracker box, wasn't it? Yeah, the, yeah that's what they called it. <laughs> but uh, th they had some great plays. I used to like to watch the the uh, Dodgers play. I mean, th th they had some uh, terrific plays. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. You know, when I first came up in 54, I beat them five times and went nine all five times. And uh, and uh, that was that was the year that uh, <laughs> that Drochu <you, laughs> was tickled to death because <laughs> he beat me three times. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, but they had a, they had a great ball team. I mean, they were they were loaded. I mean, uh, I can I hear the lineup. I I hear it my Campanella and Hodges and Jackie Robinson, Pee Wee Reese. Duke Snyder and Carl Farillo. I can just go right through the whole lineup. Billy Carl Farillo was the Springfield rifle, oh, and yet Vic Rashi, who pitched for the Yankees, was also known as the Springfield rifle. Yes, yeah, I pitched against Rashi at the end of his career. He was with St. Louis, and I thought, boy, he's he's an old guy. He can still pitch, but he wasn't near as good as he was when he was with you know the Yankees in his prime. He was great. Yeah, the, but he, he was hanging on with St. Louis at the time. But uh, uh, Vic Rashi, oh, just, oh, for, uh, there's so many stories, I tell you. The one time I remember, uh, uh, oh, we, I was pitching there, and, and uh, uh, Joe Adcock was our first baseman. Yep. And, uh, and the, the guy over in Providence, and Lick Treble of Bine, yeah, beamed him, and, and really, you know, beamed him at home plate because he had hit, the day before, he hit four home runs. And the fifth time up, he hit the wall. The, the trip, right? I remember that very well. Oh well, I pitched the next day, and uh, and uh, what's his name told me to to uh, knock one of the batters down the next day. He said, we "Get even. That that ain't right." So I thought, well, I don't. I got to hit somebody, not hit him, but knock him down. And uh, so I, I picked on the wrong guy. I picked on Jackie <laughs> Robinson. There was no outs, and there was a, and I knocked him down and. And he he, st he started trying to bunt down the first baseline the next that time and then the next time up and, and Frank Torrey then had to take first base. Yep. And Torrey came over to me with his mouth and he says, Gene, he said, Would you please let me feel everything over here? Can't you see he's trying to cut you? <laughs> so they played
played hard. <laughs> yeah, we, that, that's the way, that's the what. Back but, in those days, we were taught to play hard. Oh, you know, Eddie that, that, Stanky that's played against. Stanky was that way too, going into second base. They played pretty hard. They, they, they didn't, uh, they didn't fool around. But it was, it was fun. I really enjoyed. I enjoyed both of them. And then coming over playing with uh, oh Russell and and uh, oh my goodness. Uh, I remember them I, all. Oh, Heinsohn and Casey and Sam and Sat Sanders. I can go on all, all the guys. Bill Sharman. Of course, Jacuzzi, the Coos. The, the Coos, oh, my absolutely. And oh, he could he play. You know, I wanted to dispel a, a, a story. Of, it wasn't really a story. It was just a, 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 a tag that was put on you as being Bill Russell's backup. And oh. one time I was with Will McDonough. Now, you remember Will McDonough? Uh-huh. Well, I went to high school with Will McDonough. Oh, was that right? And a bunch of us were sitting around uh, okay. talking, and um, somebody uh, had mentioned your name, and they said, yeah, he was Bill Russell's backup. And I said, he was not Bill Russell's backup. You know, and uh, 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 Willie said, this, he, he says, he, now he jumped on the guys, and he said, for Christ's sake, he says, just take a look at the scoreboards, he says, and Russell plays 42 minutes, Conley plays 29 minutes, you know, there's only 48 minutes in the game, you know. And, well, uh, you, know, you know how that went, Jim. I remember one time we were, Red was always saying, Gene was the best backup. Red even said, Gene was the best backup man I had for Russell for years while he was there. And I, and I said, well, Red, I said, you're telling everybody that, that I was a good backup guy for Russell. And I really appreciate the compliment, but I said, you know, there's, there's 48 minutes in a game. And Russell averaged almost 46 minutes. I said, Red, that would only give me two minutes a game. Oh, and I said, I always played yep. with Russell. I never went in for Russell. Sure. He says, who gives a crap? Who gives a crap? <laughs> I know. What, wasn't he something else? <laughs> That's the way he answered. He, who gives a crap? <laughs> Our back was something else and uh, probably misunderstood by a number of people. I, I got to throw in one Our back story of my own. Go on, please. Uh, I was coming up from spring training. I had been covering the Sox down uh, south. Uh -huh. And you remember Bobby Rubino's ribs? They were famous for ribs in their sauce. Okay. So I, I brought up a couple of orders of ribs in about a quarter of the sauce and uh, brought it up to the Celtics office. Uh -huh. You know, brought into the, uh, you know, and, and they brought it into red. And so, anyhow, when I finished my business about oh, three quarters of an hour later, I'm walking out to the elevator, uh -huh. and who's standing there but our back? <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I said, how did you like the sparrows? I said, I brought up the sparrows from Bobby Rubino's. Uh -huh. And he said, for Christ's sake, they were cold. <laughs> and that's all he said. <laughs> you know, and so I didn't, say, I didn't say another word. Went down the elevator, and that was that. Uh -huh. So now about a month later... Uh, they were having some promotion uh, at uh, the, the Celtics game, uh -huh. and there was this big uh, poster picture of Red, and I wanted to get two of them, one for each one of my nephews. Uh -huh. And so I asked him if it autographed it. You know, naturally he autographed it, and I said, Red, I don't want to be a pain in the butt. I said, but would you mind doing a second one for my other nephew? And he looked at me, he says, well, you are a pain in the butt. <laughs> and, and then he autographed it. You know, with that scowl, he autographed it, and as he walked away, he says, thanks for the spare ribs. <laughs> that was, he, oh, that's funny. He that's thanks good. for the spare ribs, like, uh, like a month or two later. That's, that's red. <laughs> it was, uh, unbelievable. Oh, you but, know, he, I, I tell you, I can tell stories about him. He, he, he's, uh, <clears throat> he was, uh, I was just telling my wife the other day the story about the time that that uh, we were playing, we were playing New York one time, and and Red was playing me a, a quite a bit. It was about fifty nine six in my second year there, and I was all ready to play. I, uh, New York was wasn't that good a team in those days, and I thought, well, I'm going to have to play about a half hour at night, you know, so I better tape. And I never taped in my life, and I was Buddy LaRue taped my ankles, and I was all ready. I'm sitting there on the bench, and I'm sitting there, and I'm sitting there. 
a second. Ain't he going to put me in? Ain't he going to put me in? No, I didn't get in the ball game. So finally, there was, there was, everybody was leaving, and he sticks me in the game with about a minute to go at the end of the game. And somebody fouled me, and in those days, you had three shots to make two or something yep. like that. And I, I threw three of them up there. I was so mad, I threw three of them up there and, and went for the hat trick. I missed all three of them. <laughs> I went in, went in the locker room, and I was trying to take the tape off because I never taped, and I didn't know how to do it, and I was working real hard. In walked Walter Brown. And Walter Brown going around, he didn't know anything about basketball. He was a hockey man. Yep. And he, he kept shaking everybody's hand, going around, you know, on the benches. We didn't have lockers in those days. It was just a bench. And I'm sitting there with my head down trying to get this tape off my ankle, and I was mad because I didn't get to play. And he says, and he looked up, and he says, I looked up, and there he was, and he says, you played a fine game, Gene, fine game. I said, yeah, I sure did, didn't I, for about a minute. And Red was sitting across the bench. <laughs> Or hearing all this stuff. So after after he left, he says he came over to me, he says, You know, Mr. Brown is our boss and he, he owns this club and I, you, you weren't very nice to him uh, what you said. He said I said, Red, he told me I played a fine game. I played one minute and I did and I was and he, I did, didn't think didn't didn't think it was right for me to tell him thanks and all that stuff and he looked at me and he said, you, you better cool down. He says, how about some Chinese food? I'll take you some Spanish food. I said, I don't like Chinese food. <laughs> I, <laughs> I was still mad. Yep. Well, the next day we, we went to Philadelphia and he played me 30, 30 minutes against Will the next day. Did he ever say why he only played you that one minute? No, but I I often thought I thought later on, the son of a gun, I think he was resting me because he knew I had to wrestle Will for he wanted Russell to take the corner, and had me uh, had me wrestle Will for for uh, about a half hour. Yeah. He probably was giving Russell a break. See, I always played with Russell. I never played yep. with, I never played in for him. I was always with him, and Red and Red would give him a, a break, you know, and let Russell go over in the corner and and, and relax a little bit. He didn't even, you know, he wouldn't have yep. to block her off. He could just sweep the boards from the corner. And, uh, and I'm, I'm sure that's what he did. I, I know he did. And then, then uh, another story about Red. i got to tell you this one. This is really fun. We're playing Philadelphia. And you always want to beat Philly because of Wilton. Yep. They had great clubs. They had, they had some good players. Tom Gola and, and uh, oh, my goodness, uh, Paul, Paul Erdison. They were loaded. And uh, we had this game going. And all of a sudden, Red jumps up, just, uh, just, you know, well, actually, it was about the about the uh, third third period, and he and he jumps up off the bench and he, and he stops the game and he goes up the scorer's table and he says, "You're cheating us on the 24 second rule," and none of us knew what was going on, you know, and and he says, "You're cheating us on the 24 second rule," and then all of a sudden. The coach of the other team, it was, uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to think who it was. It was He played at Philadelphia. He was a coach there, a big center. Uh, but anyway, he, he came over. He says, our back, you're starting, this, you're starting to, all this trouble again. He, you're always doing things like this. Red, yeah. sl- Red slugged him. Sure. He, yeah, he popped him. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. The cops came out, and this and that. And Red comes to the come to come over to Russell and, and Coos and Tyson and all of them. He says, he says, you guys don't let him don't let him do this to me, don't let him do this to me. And we were behind by about four or five points. He says, don't let him do this to me. This is I've got, I can't even stay. I have to go upstairs and all that stuff. Well, we win the game by about oh I I tell you we won by about ten points. So we really really got hot and really going after it, you know. And, and he, 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 he's smoking his cigar, and he says, what I don't do is get you guys, what I don't have to take to get you guys to run a little bit. Yeah, he, he'd get himself thrown out on purpose. Sure. Un, unbelievable. But yeah. uh, 
He, he, he had to war, he, he, you had to admire a little how much he wanted to win. Gene, you want to hear something? I thought we were talking for about 25 minutes. My engineer just told me we got three minutes left. I don't believe it. We talked the whole hour. D do me a favor. Before we wind up, give me some, since this is the 100th anniversary of Fenway Park, uh -huh. uh, maybe you might have some, some thoughts, memories. Uh, uh, was there a sense of history uh, for you when you first uh, hit Fenway Park? Uh, I don't think so. I, I, w I was... I was involved in the biggest trade that was ever made. I know. That came here. Remember Frank Sullivan? Frank Sullivan, sure. <laughs> I can tell you. I can tell you what happened when I signed my contract with with the uh, with the first time with uh, I came over here. I went upstairs, went up you know the steps, and went in the office, and I saw uh, who was the general manager in '61. Oh. Wasn't it Mike Higgins? Uh, no, no, no. He, Mike Higgins was. Uh, he was a manager. Okay, but, in '61, uh, Mike was managing. Yeah. And was, um, oh you know God. something I don't remember. You know, well, anyway, I went in there and I said, he says, Gene, I want you to sign a contract, you know. And he says, uh, How much did you make last year? And I said, Well, it felt, I was making twenty thousand dollars playing a little Philly. He says, that's what I was paying Sullivan. And he says, is that all right? And I said, well, I guess so. You know, I didn't sign. And I went downstairs. My wife says, how'd you do? And I said, well, I said, I signed for 20. I didn't sign, but I talked to him about $20,000. And and then I, she didn't say a word. And I said, you know, honey, I said, Sullivan only won three games. And I won, I, I won 14 games over here. I, I mean, I won 12 games over yep. here. And she said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, we're going to drive around the block. She you drove, got the 5,000. I drove around the block. I parked. I went upstairs. We're about to get cut off, Gene. Yeah, and I said, I said well, that ain't fair. I won 12 and he won 3. And I said, we make the same. I deserve more. And he says, all right, I'll give you 5,000 more. <laughs> God bless you. Good luck. That was great. But Gene, thank you so very, very much for, for giving us the whole hour. My engineer's about to pull the plug on me. Jim, Jim you but, and I can but, talk for hours. You know that. You, you, I like your stories, too. <laughs> we'll talk again soon. Thank, Thank you again. You. Thank you, Jim. Ladies Thank and gentlemen, bye-bye. Take care, Gene. And my best to, to Kathy. Well, that about wraps it up. But this is the quickest hour I've ever had. I hope everybody out there enjoyed the show as much as I did. Uh, that was Gene Conley that you were just uh, listening to. My name is Jim Tuberosa. The name of the show is Real Grass, Real Heroes, a look at the golden age of sports. And uh, congratulations to the Red Sox and Fenway Park on the 100th anniversary. See you next time. <laughs>